Dan Morris uh, from Databricks. Thank you for joining us today. We are going to cover two uh, different topics. So we're going to start off by talking about some of just the macro trends and common use cases that we're seeing for clean rooms across all different industries. And then from there, I'm going to hand it off to John from MasterCard and Spencer from Databricks to actually show how MasterCard is using it today in practice. So just to kind of kick things off, or to set the stage, you know, we're seeing, obviously there's a bunch of market forces that are going on right now and that are kind of compelling businesses to take on various sort of new imperatives. So obviously we're seeing a lot of things going on in the privacy space uh, that's causing a lot of change and that's causing a lot of companies to really double down on first party data. When we think about all the digitization, globalization, you know, competition is obviously heating up and a lot of companies are really doubling down on all things around speed and innovation. And lastly, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that uh, gener generative AI has kind of taken the world by storm. And so from an enterprise perspective, lots of companies are really thinking about how to leverage this technology to boost productivity and enhance uh, customer experiences as well. And because of all of this, companies are really collaborating today across all different industries more than we ever have before. But at the same time, we're probably collaborating the least that we ever will again. Facilitating all this is obviously technology. So we now have marketplaces that make it super simple to gain access and use various uh, data sets. We have data sharing, so new capabilities like Delta sharing that allow you to share your data uh, with anyone, regardless of where they are, without moving your data, without replicating your data. And of course, clean rooms, which is the topic for today, that allow you to combine your data with someone else's data, produce a net new data set, and do all of this while never revealing your raw underlying data. And so now kind of jumping into each of these themes and the use cases that we see, first we have the privacy by design. Uh, and so, you know, if we think about over the last few years, we've seen lots and lots of different changes along the privacy landscape. From the regulatory perspective, we have things like GDPR, CCPA. From, you know, outside of that, we have other things that are kind of more imposed by big tech, right? So we've seen, uh, blocking of third-party cookies that was early, early on by Firefox, then later adapted by uh, Apple, deprecation of IDFA, Google with their privacy sandbox. And at the same time, we're also seeing, you know, user preferences evolve as well. And because of all of this, what we, what we see is that a lot of companies find that it's, when it comes to acquiring and engaging our customers, it's, it's a lot harder than it used to be, right? Uh, without third-party tracking, you have less visibility into how to, how to understand your customers, how to efficiently engage your customers, how to uh, acquire them. And at the same time, as I mentioned, we, we're seeing this ever kind of evolving in terms of uh, privacy, right? to the point where two out of every three uh, Apple users will select SGAP not to track. And so when you bring these two things together, what ends up happening is that we're, we almost end up perpetuating the fact that two out of three dollars spent in marketing goes to large uh, tech companies. And as a result of this, we're seeing new, new trends emerge, right? So one, companies are very much doubling down on first party data. Uh, we've seen this for a, little, uh, for a couple years now, but it's now really, really ramping up. PII is becoming the new backbone of lots of different identifiers that are out there, such as UID2 in the marketing space. And then lastly, of course, data clean rooms are increasingly being used as a way to harness each other's data. And so when we look at or think about how this is done in practice, there's lots of really cool use cases that are showing up across all these different industries with respect uh, to this privacy by design. So game studios is an interesting use case where we see, even though game studios are competing for attention, they're actually exchanging uh, lists with each other to harness the fact that you have people who have an affinity for games that you can use. So kind of just showing that it's not a zero-sum game and we're able to share data. Similar thing we see with loyalty programs. So a canonical example would be, a canonical example would be like an airline and a hotel exchanging data because you have an affinity uh, for loyalty programs. On um, the media measurement is also another huge case, right? It's very, very hard 
uh, to get visibility into reach, so the number of people that you're able to reach across a wide, around, uh, wide variety of platforms. And data clean rooms is a mechanism to, to really facilitate all of that. And of course, there's other, other cases as well, things like retail media networks. When we get into the competition space, this is where we're seeing companies really double down on speed and innovation as another imperative. And I think Deborah Golden from Deloitte sums it up pretty well when she said, you know, <laughs> if you're standing still, you're basically moving backwards. And we know that obviously speed and innovation is important, uh, but we've, there's actually a study that was done recently, and you know, what they found, it was from Fast Company and Deloitte, and what they found was that the, the companies that are actually the most innovative, and they did categorization of all the companies, are actually investing up almost 15% of, of their actual uh, revenue. And this kind of just goes to show the, uh, the fact that most innovative companies are very intentional about the investments that they make, and it pays off, because there was another study that was undertaken by McKinsey that showed that these companies are actually seeing twice as much revenue come from products that were products and services released within the last year, uh, opposed to their peers. And BCG backs that up as well by showing shareholder returns are, are up. But in practice, bringing that to back to clean rooms, there's lots of cool opportunities that are coming up. We're seeing on the financial services side, for example, there is a, an interesting opportunity where you're actually able to create new data products to sell to your customers that you wouldn't be able to do before. We also see that on the telecommunications side. So if you think about the type of data that you get from 5G, IoT, if you think about a, a wearable that has a health healthcare bent to it, there's opportunities uh, with insurance companies, with healthcare practitioners. So lots of opportunities to really open the doors to the new types of data products that you can make. Healthcare is another super interesting uh, area. It actually takes up to 15 years to release a new drug. Uh, real world evidence is a way to accelerate that. And the way it's done is you're basically saying what you're finding in the lab is representative of what you're gonna find in practice at scale. And clean rooms is a way to facilitate that. And then lastly, on the retail side, we're also seeing a huge opportunity. If you think about the hundreds or thousands of suppliers that a large uh, retailer is working with, there's an opportunity to provide the level of insights that their suppliers need to really be competitive and you know, boost their promotions within, within the store. And then lastly, generative AI. Uh, you know, I think this is really kind of transform the way, or it's going to transform the way that we interact with people, with content, with data. And so lots of opportunities, but on the enterprise side, we really see a lot around productivity and customer experience. And so backing that up as well, there was another uh, study that, that was done that showed, this one was done by McKinsey, and it showed productivity across a whole bunch of different areas. But I think the two that were the most interesting uh, were customer care and marketing operations. And so with customer care, what they found, and if you think about it, like a telecom, uh, these are companies that have really, really large operations around uh, customer care. What they found was that using generative AI uh, for customer care, they're actually able to uh, boost, time, boost issue resolution by almost 15%. They're able to decrease the time to resolution uh, by almost 10%. But more strikingly, the, the value of all the productivity savings actually comes out to around 30 to 45% of total, uh, total spend which is a huge opportunity to redirect those dollars. Similar you see on the marketing side. So there's opportunities to use it for creating uh, copy, for the images that you're gonna use for analyzing data. And similar story there where uh, around almost 10% of spend can actually be recouped uh, using this technology. And this is actually one of the really interesting use cases that we're starting to actually see come up quite a bit for clean rooms and it's something that uh, you can actually enable through something like Databricks Plain Rooms is this concept of LLMs as a service. So there are certain uh, areas where you have very technical or domain specific data and you need to sort of fine tune a model to really be, to be able to reason over that type of information. And there's now opportunities where you can take that, commercialize it with your customers, use it within a clean room in such a way that you can give full guarantees that you won't get any of the 
the, in, the data that's being used for, for inference. So this is a huge area that we're starting to see uh, come up in conversations. Lastly, before I hand it off to MasterCard, uh, today we announced public preview for our data clean room. Uh, if you're interested, we would love to, to bring you on. But with that, I'm gonna now hand it off to uh, John and Spencer. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I'm gonna hand it off to John. Just for, um, first off, thank you, because this is like the last of the last. We went yesterday at five o'clock, and just the volume, so it's, thank, uh, thanks. Um, did anybody see the presentation yesterday that Spencer and I did? Okay. Thank you. We're gonna thank you, but we're gonna do it in a third of the time. So some of the slides are different, and thanks for all the questions. So just to make this all relevant for you guys, who here is currently like really, really interested in clean rooms versus mildly like, yes, this is on my horizon, I need to figure stuff out versus I'm starting the journey. Okay, that's Great. awesome. So the whole point of this is to connect, for me to connect with you and say, what do you need to move this forward? Because we've been working with, um, this has been an idea we've had for quite a while from MasterCard's point of view, but then also working with uh, Databricks, private preview for how long were we going? Eight months since we got you the preview, two years since you started asking for it. So in the last eight months, we were able to accelerate and now it's really starting to move forward. So the more use cases we have, the more we can think about how we can help um, Databricks' roadmap meet our needs. So, And this is really just the beginning. I wanna emphasize that to your point, like, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Just to set the stage for MasterCard, I'm gonna go through this because the demo is what's cool. We did it live, live, live yesterday. We have a lot of things because we don't wanna have any hiccups today and keep you any longer. Um, okay, MasterCard and part of our business, just so you get an idea, um, we're beyond a credit card company. When you think about us by the numbers, you can see the stats that are right there, how big we are, but it's super important that when you think about our growth, we're anchored in trust. Full stop. So because of the fact we're anchored in trust in what we need to do with our growing um, data profile, the concepts around clean rooms are super important for the insights that we can have and what we can do with them for data for good, as well as other benchmarking uh, products you may have seen out there based on these aggregated sets of data. So being a trusted provider of insight, you can see we're growing beyond payments and services, but new networks and capabilities. Most important thing are those three words of value, utility, and privacy. Because of that, Clean Rooms really helps bring forth what we want to do to continue to go forward. And a bit about pets. We're not gonna give the dogs and cats, but that is Callie and Poppy, and then your cats. Bruce and LeBron. Okay, so with this, it's really important to figure out that this whole space is growing and emerging. We feel it is critical, but it's also a competitive advantage and complex. I'll skip all the pet jokes and jump right into this. This is really important, that top line there, that these are emerging set of technologies. So in a clean room, we are starting now to stack and ladder pet capabilities. I'm gonna explain what that is in a minute. Because with this, these capabilities, not only within the clean room itself, are gonna ensure continued compliance, what we have to think about consumers and banks, but also merchants' information. So when you think about this, it's not just the privacy of the row, but the confidentiality of the set of information. Super important. Um, the other thing is this is growing. If you're on your patch journey and someone says, well, is this gonna make us any money? That's the quote you need. Um, it's a huge market and it's continuing to grow. Um, critical for the business, but it's beyond just compliance. We partner a lot with our teams in privacy, but this is gonna deliver a competitive advantage for us going forward. And then lastly, these are complex, which is the reason why we've been partnering with Databricks and other providers to help make this not um, technology in search of a use case, but use cases that get solved with technology. Um, high level, one you would think there would be this sort of traditional teeter-totter trade-off, the more privacy you have, the less useful. That is not the case when pets are done correctly. And just to show there are a handful of different technologies that we're looking at on this spectrum of perfect data privacy to um, 
perfect data utility. And based on where you are in your journey, this can be really helpful for you. But what's kind of cool about this is you really need the governing framework. And it's not just about every use case you have, how to spin it up, how to tear it down. Everyone's gonna require it. So let's just take all the tools and technologies and put them in that bottom left. What are the requirements? What are the use case? What do I need to mask? What are the processing requirements? And then picking the pet. Then using that within the use case for the clean room. And by the way, at the end of the day, what we're doing with Unity for the validation and documentation is making this really key and one of the reasons we're starting with Databricks. So for pets, again, this is a general grouping, so I'm apologizing in advance if, this, if I'm offending any technology providers here, but I think about it on the one side, you've got the data masking and marking stuff. You may have heard of differential privacy and the traditional data masking techniques. Now let's go beyond that and think about synthetic data, not synthetic data just for testing or Unreal Engine you would use, but now making a digital twin of the data. There's GAN and non-GAN approaches, different ones are good for you and your use cases. Go all the way to the right. No, you're, you're right, yeah. Model-based, it's late. Um, thinking about this, when you think about the models, it's this is more about um, jurisdictional silos, data sovereignty we have to work with. These are other solutions, but what we're trying to do is crash all these together in a clean room for those governed, protected collaborations. And doing some simple pip installs, we've actually proved that these things can run on serverless, which has been really cool for some of the use cases. Um, moving forward, when we think about the clean rooms, and yes, we're the ones that are allowed to use the MasterCard logo for stuff when they did that the other day, and we caught that, we are just like, no, no. They're like, you can't license Venn diagrams. I'm like, kind of we can. So thing about this ephemeral environment, spin them up and tear them down very fast. And Spencer's gonna show you that right now. And what's really cool, when I say when they're done correctly, it's really important um, from data privacy, data leakage. It's really important to the clean rooms just because you have it doesn't mean it's going to work the way you want. If you're a technologist, you know exactly what I mean. The value, speed, trust, and revenue via the innovation Dan talked about these before. And those are some of the use cases a little deeper than what Dan had. Modalities. When we think about this, peer-to-peer -peer and hub and spoke, internal and external. So I could think about if I have a data partners, two pieces that Dan mentioned, those are the external use cases. But even internal, for us at Mastercard, we have a lot of subsidiaries that we need to be careful of how we govern and manage our data. So you've got a data host and a data user. This makes it a lot easier. So if you're a big company and you acquire a lot of companies, this is gonna be really fun. And then when you think about the hub and spoke between the data contributors and users in a combined source, if you ever do with KYC or AML or any other combined sources you need to have, this works really, really well here. What's been fun for us to build out on our journey with Databricks are those additional capabilities. Yes, in that notebook to have your logic beyond regex to match those two data sets. But with the privacy preserving compute, we layer in it gets even more use cases. And what we were built with our um, partner, uh, REARC, one of the SIs, we built an intelligent logging agent. This thing was really cool. Based upon every interaction, writing the metadata to Unity Catalog that not just supports that governance we need to have for auditing purposes and regulations, but to do it in such a way, are you gonna be able to pull up the report? Mm -hmm. Cool. With like fifth grade math of what happened and why it happened and why it was okay. Um, and then getting into the summary statistics, what's a little bit cool about that with the report, and just for kicks, we took, we have about 100 plus assets on what are pets and how they could be used by all the different technologies, dropped them into UC, and in two weeks, we built the knowledge bot that's embedded into the clean room as an agent. So if I'm a person of a privacy attorney, what should I look for in this report when the data is too close? If I'm a technologist, how do I spin it up? How do I tear it down? If I'm a business owner, how do I even use this? So we built persona-based insights on our data, on the information about how to use a clean room. Because I mentioned before, it's a lot about education because I get so many emails and telling people go check it out on the Confluence page is kind of a cop out. So this was actually really cool and not that hard to build. Um, did I miss anything on this? No, I think one of the coolest pieces about using everything together, like the Unity Catalog, plus Databricks, AI, BI, plus the Clean Room itself, plus Mosaic, is just how quick it all went. 
Like right. you said, all this stuff was eight months. I mean, eight it's months. Just, yeah. All right. How this all starts to fit together. This is a nice thing. If you want to take a picture, this is the way if this resonates with. And again, I tried to make slides you can um, take pictures of because I hated being in the audience and being like, what is this? So what's cool about this, if you think about it, you've got the collaborator, A and B. you got the bookends, spin up and tear down. But what's really, really fun in the middle with those use case requirements, that's the stuff about that governing process. So when we sit down with the business owner and we do the quote unquote privacy brief, what it needs to be, what data, how is it going to be used, and we all sit together, and we understand what are the controls, what we're going to mask, what we're going to join. During that time, that's when we understand what are the KPIs and metadata I need to write to Unity Catalog. So in a one hour meeting, I've already taken the, uh, it was called Lakehouse IQ, you guys rebranded it to. Databricks AIBI. Databricks AIBI. So during my requirement session, I'm figuring out what KPIs I need, what metadata I need to create, and then I figure out, I literally make that report right there and Spencer's gonna show you. That's why that governing process, and when we hopefully put this out on the marketplace for some folks to use our templates, um, it'll be really built in um, with the appropriate legal indemnifications, but you guys will have a nice quick start. Then when we get it in there in that clean room, part of it is what we do with MasterCard. When we bring the data into the clean room, we have our, our sort of dials of privacy and utility and those checks run. Additionally, when that data is brought in, if this needs to be for certain AI use cases, we can check for bias. So now I'm starting to add all of my capabilities on the data on ingest, but also on execution. And at this point, what we're trying to say is, do I need to do uh, synthesize the data on the way in? It's not just privacy on the way out, we're doing privacy on the way in. Do I need to digitally watermark the data on the way in? This is going into an LLM, I now can understand whose data is going into that model on the way in. So it's privacy on the way in, not just noise on the way out. Um, result shared are a few iterations, but the whole idea is I put my notebook in, Spencer has his notebook, I say what he can do with my data, you say do with your data, we both agree on the KPIs, and writing to each other's Unity catalog and what agreements we have, and it's torn down. Anything else? No, I'm gonna dive deep into steps four and five, so just kinda you know, hold that in, in RAM for a couple minutes. All right, lastly, um, something else here, if you're trying to figure out where the value pieces come in, this will be hard for me at the end of the day, but I'll try to say it, the flexibility, scalability, interoperability, yes, and auditability all happens here because of the clean room on serverless. And getting serverless approved by your um, infosecs, it's not that hard because of this. And that's what's been really cool along the way. Now, when you think about the capabilities, many you're already using. You're already using Delta. You're already using UC. That ephemeral isolated um, compute with scale, ephemeral, your privacy attorneys, once they understand what that is, they definitely relax and they're like, okay, so it's gone. I don't have to worry about people getting access to it afterwards. Like, no, it's gone. But I still get a report of how it was used. Yes. Privacy was our biggest hurdle that we needed to get through and they helped us make this. Technology was easy. The business owners are the hardest ones because they're just like, what is it again? So um, helping them with it and that's when the intelligence engine happens with all the reports and the KPIs. Thanks, John. So. One of the things, uh, I, I gave a session um, on a similar topic with data monetization last year, kind of thinking about how all this fits together holistically. What is Delta sharing doing? Where does Unity Catalog fit into this, right? And we got a lot of great outcomes, right? We're able to share data across clouds, share data back to on-prem customers, all completely open. But the more time I spend with, or spent with John and MasterCard, I realized these gaps, right? Where Essentially, there's types of data that can't be copied. It, it can't leave certain regions of the cloud or certain nationalities, right? The types of ways that we comply with audits that don't necessarily conform with the way that Delta sharing vanilla works, right? PII data, like John talked about, being able to enforce quality checks on the data. With the Delta uh, share, it's great, I, I get what you gave me, but I have no enforcement mechanism to say, hey, I asked for you know zip plus four and you only gave me zip, right? It, it's just what's in the box is what's in the box. 
you can't enforce privacy dynamically, right? You have privacy controls, you have masking, partitioning, but if you on the fly realize, hey, I wasn't planning to mask this, but because of the situation I'm running into during execution, I need to pivot, very hard to do, easy in a clean room. And one of the critical things to me is with lowest common denominator security model. So let me take a step back and explain that. So like John was just mentioning with the spin up and, and tear down idea, right? In the past, if you told your customer, hey, I'm gonna share this data with you, please use it in this way, right? There might be legal terms, but that's it, right? It, it, it's not a physical barrier protection. If an intern screws up, you can sue them, right? But the data got leaked, right? And so that security model doesn't work for tons of data. So what we're excited to introduce with pets is this new architecture, right? Where essentially you have this serverless compute plane that gives you another path for those data sharing mechanisms that do have those requirements. And so essentially with these new capabilities, we can enforce exfiltration controls. We can provide through the pets enhanced system tables, really easy uh, auditing and reporting. And all this is layered with MasterCard sensitivity controls, right? They understand data and privacy in a way that, you know, in my humble opinion, there, there's no other uh, firm with that level of understanding, right? And that can now be layered in through clean rooms as a mechanism. And then as you'll see in the demo, this is all driven by Databricks notebooks, right? This isn't a Kluge SDK that you're running on prem or pinning together all these different systems. This is just Databricks. And critically, again, because it's using the serverless compute plane, you don't have that lowest common denominator security model, right? We're enforcing when and how the compute goes away, what's allowed in, what's not. And critically, there's no Databricks like A tier security model for serverless and C tier. It's all hardened, it's all encrypted, everything's private linked, everything's S3 gateway. And so frankly, the use cases that I had to go through your approval team with for classic were about 10 times as hard as the serverless ones because it's just an erector set instead of a fully built you know, Eiffel Tower, right? So let's go back to what John shared. How much time do you want for your demo? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, thank just you. I'll move quick through this. So just going back to John's slide, let's just focus on how we enforce transparency, flexibility, and some of these other controls. So just real quick, did anyone take their Spark, uh, their Spark Associate cert this week? Anyone have it? Okay, cool. So you guys can help explain this afterwards. So I'm gonna zoom through this. So. Um, essentially, what you're seeing here is the notebook cells that you would see in your clean room, but then underneath is the actual Spark physical plan. So basically, what you're seeing is that any given step, we're minimizing the amount of data that's read in, right? It's not until step three that we actually even scan any data. It's only metadata. And then in step three, because of pushdown filtering, we're only reading in a certain ID column. The other columns that aren't needed yet, they are not actually read into clean room memory until they're needed. And then in the final step is the only place where uh, data is actually read and then written out into an output. So you can kind of see with that cell color, everything until the final step is happening purely in memory. So if the clean room were to stop, that data is gone, right? And the only thing you get a record of is this output. So what this all connects together to provide is this additional layer of capabilities on top of our existing uh, collaboration and trust matrix I shared in my talk last year. So basically the DI platform, it solved half the puzzle, right? We made it so you could have secure data sharing and address certain privacy scenarios. But what pets do by integrating on top of the DI platform is add this other access for privacy and all the things that MasterCard specializes in, right? So enough chatting, let's jump into the demo. So first thing I'm gonna do is make it so that you guys can actually see. Like you're logged demo. into our dev environment again? Yeah. All right, Absolutely. so this is running explain. MasterCard secure dev environment is connecting to, to pull this stuff up. Absolutely. So this is private preview, not GA, so if some things look. Yeah, 
So this is, this is private preview, but I'm in a MasterCard right. environment. I'm going to go ahead and maybe you need to defer that. So we're in Databricks, right? And I want to call out, this is a, a MasterCard sandbox that went through all the hardened security controls. It is deployed, it is real. And so the first thing I can do is go into my Unity catalog. And I have my clean rooms here. And it's as simple as to create a clean room, I can give it a, a name and drop a sharing identifier, right? We have short time today, so I've already built a few. So what we can see when we go into this uh, uh, particular clean room, actually, let me go to this one instead. So I can see the assets in the clean room, right? So I've shared some data sets. In this case, they're tables. It could be models, could be volumes, could be an LLM endpoint, right? Um, and also a notebook. And essentially, uh, this notebook is what allows me uh, to essentially see what's happening in the clean room and decide whether I'm okay with executing it and kind of sh transmitting my data in this way. So what's cool about the notebook driven flow is like John mentioned at the top, we can load in all these libraries dynamically. So basically based off the parameters you passed into the run, you might choose pets one and three, but not use pet two, right? Or you might bring in your own libraries to double check that MasterCard is doing what they're supposed to, right? And so as we go through this, we initiate logging, right? And start writing out all of this telemetry as we go through it. And then these privacy checks we imported, we can use to essentially control the way that data flows out of our data frames. So calling back to my slide, as you know, I'm sure you all know, when I create a data frame, all this is doing is, is reading some metadata, right? There's no data actually read in until I perform a Spark action. So down here, before we perform a Spark action. Oh, so the data that they're joined to, this is, a, you're on a query. Please, yeah. So what we've got is we've taken a MasterCard, we call it kind of our yellow pages, it's called our places data set. So it's information on, um, is it 35, 35 million or 30? 35 million um, businesses. So you're okay. just going to query cross join against these 35 million that we've loaded on up here. But we don't necessarily want to give away all the firmographic data about all these companies because I can license it to you, but are you going to do some other joins that are joining to other data that I may not feel too comfortable with? Absolutely. And so the mechanism by which you uh, read that data is through these privacy check libraries, right? So we say these are the um, columns I want, and then I'm basically using the privacy check runner to execute those Spark statements. And so it outputs this telemetry of, okay, privacy two passed, privacy one passed. If either of these had failed, the notebook would stop executing and we're done. And this is what the lawyers love. So based on each use case, I may have some base checks and some enhanced checks. Some enhanced checks based upon um, one of the companies that we recently acquired um, has things beyond what you would have in an open source library. It's already tuned, two dials, privacy and utility, setting that up based upon the checks, based upon those thresholds, everything all stacked together and laddered together. And in that workflow, if any of those checks fail, the job will stop. Absolutely. And so as we go through this, I can, now that I've confirmed the privacy checks passed, I'm okay to read this data, I've read it into memory, and I can do a crossover analysis and generate a, a scoring threshold and use that to generate uh, some plots of, how, of what match rate we have between these two data sets. So I mentioned before having this output of a table, here it's only this graph, right? So when I go back to look at the model later, I don't have any data table just sitting there in an output. Yeah, so as Dan mentioned, if you have monetization use cases and you're like, hey, I've got this great, say credit risk model, credit risk insights, and you just, somebody's like, well, I wanna, I just wanna test and see what's my simple oversight, overlap. This is ridiculously easy to do in the morning to help accelerate sales of those insight products. Absolutely. So let me show you uh, two more things. So one is let's go ahead and jump over to uh, AIBI, like John mentioned. So I'm going to go over to my dashboards and then I have my uh, clean room notebook report. And this is taking all of that telemetry and uh, making it available through AIBI Genie. So what's cool is I can see my how my privacy engine is doing, what my base privacy checks are, right? But um, we aren't on the newest uh, build with, with the Genie button, but like you saw in the keynote, here I can click Genie and start asking natural language questions on top of the same data. 
So that connects us back to uh, you know, the, the riskiest part of the demo. So I'm gonna fire up my node server here. Are you gonna I do don't that? need to defer. Um, so this essentially lets me ask natural language questions from our knowledge bot. And John, do you wanna kind of explain more about KB? Right. So what this really was, was to see if we actually could. So with this, we said, all right, we have three main personas of users who we have to who support these. So have, I'm going to pick data strategy. Okay, data strategy, we have product owners. So you could ask different questions based upon all of the information we have a mask about privacy technologies, claims, what you can and can't do of this, of the data. So think about all the emails, all the meetings, all the lines at your privacy offices, all the, like all that is gone. Mm -hmm. We had over 80 plus use cases, 50 plus vendors looked at, partner with looking and over 10 different POCs to get all that out and get it in somebody's hands. I do not scale, this can scale. So, so my, my web UI isn't connecting to my endpoint. So I'm just gonna go over to the endpoint right, and show this live out of model serving. But basically I have this uh, chatbot persona and I can query the endpoint. And so you can see, I have this persona of an assistant. And so I, I can send a request and it will essentially uh, allow me to understand what pet to use, right? Or answer questions about like, hey, I saw this crossover threshold. How should I respond to that? Or what else should I do? So essentially um, this LLM allows you to go way further with the clean room and not require you know, expertise from every single member of the team. It was, again, this was just something fun because we talked about what's challenging with all these privacy technologies in the clean rooms and explaining serverless, like how do we just get everybody to get on the same page and understand it? That's what we've had the, one of the hardest times with and we're still on that journey to keep figuring it out. And it's not technology looking for the use case, it's the use case to be sorted by the technology. Yeah, and, and this is just a cool example from uh, our Langchain notebook where we've done a couple of these examples for when the web server fails, is you can <laughs> see, you know, it can tell me about Spark, it can tell me about clean rooms, but it doesn't talk about why the sky is blue. So it we, will talk about pets, but not about yeah. cats and dogs. So DBRX was one model, what was the other one that we did? Yeah, DBRX and then uh, Llama. Yeah. It's the only two we used. Absolutely. Um, cool. And you know, all of this is fed by uh, non-hallucinatory PowerPoint, confluence pages, approved documents. So this thing is very much bound to reality. And if you're like, hey, that sounded sketchy, there's a source right here so you can check for yourself and you know, close the loop. So, you know, is there anything else you want me to show? I think we're ready for questions. Yeah, and again, for Feel please free if you're exhausted and you want to contact us afterwards, but I don't know if there's any other questions hey, you guys. I just realized why the uh, UI wasn't working. I forgot to log off the VPN. I'm sorry. So anyway, All so right. that's, that's fine. Uh, so the MasterCard security is working. Uh, oh, I just got really loud. The way that the, the notebook execution works, essentially, I'm, I'm as a, uh, a data provider, I am analyzing this notebook and saying, this is, the, this is what you want me to do. And I'm evaluating whether I'm okay with it. So I would look at this code and say, oh, I see that you're outputting a column you're not supposed to. I'm not gonna click run. <laughs> so I just go tell you, you know, fix this. So to his point, I give you a notebook, you give me a notebook, we both agree, that's it. And right now the insights are locked in the clean room and they're working to have the tables be available outside the clean room well so that's yeah. coming hopefully in the third quarter so where a pet fits into that is what if you're saying well i don't know what columns are okay to give away or not yes. the privacy engine dynamically helps you determine what can go in what can go out and trace the impact of it full life cycle Hang on, sir. Now we actually have a working microphone stand. Yeah, on. I think we have four of them, so knock on wood. I have another four. That's okay. Is all this running on the serverless or still on, on the computer? Fully serverless. Fully serverless. Anyone else? Just raise I, your hand. I would, in fact, argue that you can't have a clean room without serverless. If anyone tries to tell you otherwise, send them my way. Right. Great. Guys, thank thanks you so much all so for much. sticking around. Really appreciate it.